Muslims had. The amount of advances they made is tremendous. You know, there were Muslim scientists who were far advanced from the 8th to 12th century. If you know the scientific history, that Muslims were far advanced in several fields. In several. The first person who discovered the blood circulation was Ibn Nafis, 600 years after the revolution of the Quran. But today we know of William Harvey. William Harvey described blood circulation 400 years after Ibn Nafis. But no one knows about Ibn Nafis. Everyone knows about William Harvey. Media is in their hand. Then further, the first person who drew the world map was the Arab, Ali Drusi, in 1154. Mathematics, Muslim the fire advanced. The zero was learned from the Indians. The Arabs introduced zero and the decimal point to the world. In trigonometry, Muslim the fire advanced. If you know Al Biruni, he was expert in trigonometry and maths. We learn about the Pythagoras theorem in school that the square of the hypotenuse is equal to the sum of the square of the other two sides. Pythagoras theorem. Who, who discovered it? A Muslim, Al Abtusi, a Muslim. He discovered it. We know about Pythagoras theorem. We don't know about Al Abtusi. We are to blame. The media is in their hands. If you know Al Kindi, he was expert in physics, in mathematics. He first said that all laws aren't absolute; they are relative. All physical laws are absolute. Newton, Galileo, all of them said all physical laws are absolute. Al Kindi said no, they are relative. It was Albert Einstein who later on did more research and propounded the theory of relativity. We know about Albert Einstein. No one knows about Al Kindi. Shakir, Muhammad, and Ahmad, these three brothers, they gave the surface area of the earth by measuring angle at the Red Sea. When people thought the world was flat. The person who first distilled alcohol, we learn in school, Geber, Geber. What is Geber? He's Jabir, Jabir ibn Hayyan. They even Latinized the name so that we don't come to know he's a Muslim. You know, Geber sounds like a Westerner, Geber. Jabir. If you say Jabir, you know it's a Muslim. When we say Geber, a Westerner. Jabir ibn Hayyan was expert in the field of chemistry. He distilled alcohol and the word alcohol comes from the word Algul, meaning an evil spirit. We learn in a school, Geber, Geber, Jabir. 2,000 works he wrote only on chemistry. Ali ibn Abbas, expert in the field of uh, medicine. If you know about uh, Muhammad Zakaria Razi, he was expert. He spoke about measles and smallpox. The findings of his was tremendous. We know Avicenna, Avicenna. Who is Avicenna? Ali ibn Sina, Avicenna. Avicenna sounds like a westerner. Ali ibn Sina. He is known as the Aristotle of the East. So the media is in their hand. The Muslims were tremendous, they were powerful. We were on the top, we were the torch bearers. Why? Because we were close to the Quran and the Sunnah. Today, Muslims are going to the dogs, I'm saying. Dogs. You know why? We are backward. Why? Because we are going away from our religion. The reason the Westerners are advancing is because they too are going away from the religion. The next question is, uh, Mr. Atul Menon is keen on knowing why do Muslims have non-veg food? Killing an animal is a ruthless, merciless act. Why do Muslims have non-veg food? The question posed was that why do Muslims have non-veg food? Killing animal is ruthless, why don't take life, etc. You should be vegetarian. And these many of our non-Muslim friends in India, especially the Hindus and Jain, they tell us. If you analyze the set of teeth, of the herbivorous animal, like the cow, the goat, the sheep, they have got flat teeth. They only eat vegetables. If you analyze the set of teeth of the carnivorous animal, lion, tiger, leopard, they have got pointed set of teeth. Point set of teeth. But if you analyze the set of teeth of the human beings, we have flat teeth as well as pointed teeth. Herbivorous teeth as well as carnivorous teeth. We have an omnivorous set of teeth. If Almighty God wanted us to have only vegetables, why did He give us this pointed teeth? Why? He wanted us to have both. Where is that non-veg? Again, the digestive system of the cow can only digest vegetables. It can't digest non-veg. The digestive system of the carnivorous animal, lion, tiger, leopard, can only digest non-veg, can't digest vegetables. The digestive system of the human being can digest both non-veg and veg. If Almighty God wanted us to have only vegetables, why did He give us a digestive system which can digest both veg and non veg? And further, if you analyze that most of the religious scripture, whether it's Bible or Veda or Ramayana, they give permission to have non veg. If you read the Hindu scriptures, the sages and sons, they had non veg. They even ate beef. 
If you read Ayodhya Khandam, chapter number 20, chapter 26, chapter number 94, it says when Ram was sent for Banwas, he told his mother that I will have to sacrifice my tasty meat dishes. If he had to sacrifice tasty meat dishes, that means he had meat. When Ram can have meat, why can't you have meat? People may not know the details of Ramayana, but they surely know the outline story of Ramayana, that when Ram was sent for Banwas, even his wife Sita accompanied him. And once Sita asked Ram to kill the buck. You may be knowing the story, you know, it comes on the television and comic strips, that Sita asked Ram to kill the buck. You ask a Hindu friend, why did Sita ask Ram to kill the buck, to kill the deer? So some people may argue, oh, maybe Sita wanted a pet. So you ask, that if Sita wanted a pet, what will Sita do with a dead pet? What will Sita do with a dead pet? She asked Ram to kill the bug because she wanted to eat the meat. There's no other answer. So when she can have non-veg, why can't you have non-veg? Now there are some of the people who argue are saying that if you analyze, Hindu scriptures give permission. But the reason why they even became vegetarian is because they were being influenced by other philosophies like Jainism, etc., which believed in Ahimsa. Now if you argue with the Jain and you ask with these Hindus now who have given up non-veg, some of them, when you ask them why should we not have non-veg, so they will tell you, non-veg is killing living creatures. If you kill living creatures, bad. Therefore you should have only plants. Today science has advanced and we have come to know that even plants are living creatures. Previously people thought plants have no life. But today we have come to know even plants are living creatures, they have life. So the argument has changed. Yes, brothers Arkad, we know that plants have life. But you know, plants can't feel pain. Therefore, killing a plant is less a sin as compared to killing an animal. Today, science has further advanced and we have come to know, even the plants can feel pain. They can even cry. They even feel happy. Do you know that? Research has shown to us today that the plants even feel happy. They can even cry. They feel pain. But the thing is, you cannot hear their cry. Because the human frequency is from 20 cycles per second to 20,000 cycles per second. Anything below and above this you can't hear. You know silent dog whistle? The dog can hear till 40,000 cycles per second. So the silent dog whistle is the frequency above 20,000 cycles per second so that the human beings can't hear, but below 40,000 cycles per second so that the dog can hear. So when the master whistles, the dog comes running, but human beings can't hear. So similarly, when the cry given out by the plant, the human means can't hear because it is not within the range of the human hearing. But even the plants, they cry. There was a non-Muslim who had the maximum argument with me. He said, okay, brother, I agree with you. Plants have got life. Plants can feel pain. But you know, plants have got lesser senses. They have got two or three senses. Animal has got five senses. Therefore, killing animal is a bigger crime. So I said, I agree with you. For sake of argument, I agree with you that plants have got lesser senses. Animal have got more senses. But I ask you a question that suppose your brother, he is born deaf and dumb, two senses less, deaf and dumb. When he grows up, afterwards, someone comes and kills him. So will you go and tell the judge, oh me Lord, give the murderer less punishment because my brother had two senses less, he was dumb and he was deaf. In fact, you will tell him, Usne to masum ko maara hai. he has killed an innocent person, you should give him double punishment. In Islam, the Quran gives permission that you can have meat. Quran says in Surah Maida, chapter 5, verse number 1, you can have the meat of the cattle, of the animal, four-footed animal, with the exception name. Quran further says in Surah Nahal, chapter 16, verse number 5, that of the meat you can eat. Quran says in Surah Mominun, chapter 23, verse 21, that in the cattle is an instructive sign for you. We give you milk to drink from the bodies, and in them are various benefits of the meat you can eat. So very well, because Quran says you can have the good things that we have provided, there's no problem at all in having non-veg. Hope that answers the question. There is a related question asked by another non-Muslim brother. Brother Giriraj would like to know, science tells us that whatever you eat has an effect on your behavior. Why does Islam allow Muslims to eat non-veg food? Because eating of animals makes a person violent and ferocious. Please explain. The brother asked a question that whatever you eat has an effect on your behavior and I do agree with that's a scientific explanation. Whatever you have has an effect on your behavior. So why do you all have non-veg? Because you are non-veg, you all are ferocious people, you know, all violent, fighting and terrorism and attacking. What you all eat has an effect on your behavior and I do agree, science tells that what you eat 
it has certain things, certain times it has the effect on the behavior. Therefore, the Quran says in Surah Araf, chapter 7, verse 157, it says that the Prophet has allowed you things which are good and has prohibited you from having things which are bad. He's made for you permissible things which are benefit for you and has prohibited you from having things which are wrong for you. That's the reason in Islam, the Prophet said, it's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari and Sahih Muslim, you are not allowed to have the meat of the carnivorous animal like tiger, leopard, cat, etc. We are only allowed to have the meat of the herbivorous animal. You know carnivorous animals, they are ferocious. We have meat of the herbivorous animal like cow, goat, sheep. So we have to behave, you know, as mild and as soft like the cow, like the goat, like the sheep. So whatever you eat has an effect on the behavior. We eat cow, beef, meat of the sheep and goat, which are herbivorous animal, you know, domestic animal, loving animal. We are not allowed to have meat of the canine animal, like, you know, tiger, lion, leopard, neither of the rodents like rat and reptiles, a prophet and Sahih Bukhari, neither birds of prey like falcon, vultures, etc. So these are prophet prohibited, therefore we are kind and peace-loving people. Thank you, Dr. Zakir Naik. The question and answer session is over. Now I would like to ask our chairman, Mr. Saduddin Sali, to give a briefing. Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, Salatu wa Salaam ala Rasulul Kareem. Dr. Zakir Naik, brothers and sisters, except one lady, I thank Almighty Allah for having given me this opportunity to be with you and also to hear the scholarly vocabulary of Dr. Zakir Naik. He is an asset, asset to the community and not only to our community but to the mankind as a whole. We want such Zakir Naiks in many more numbers to discuss, not only give a speech, to discuss the questions which are coming like firing stones from the audience and he can explain it better, thereby thwarting the disbelief and misunderstanding in our community as well as inter-communities. So I pray Almighty Allah to grant him strength and long life and also congratulate his Islamic Research Foundation who are in this human service. I also congratulate at this juncture the team of Abdul Salam Puttige, my brother, and Mr. Sal uh, Yasin Sahai, who are actually in the field of Madhima, which is the topic today. They are starting a daily newspaper. I congratulate him and also I thank the organizers for having given me this opportunity. Thank you, one and all. Jazakallah khai. Asalaamu Alaikum. The last item for today's topic is vote of thanks. I thank uh, Chairman Mr. Sali for having come here and accepted the invitation and conducted the meeting in a very nice way. And Dr. Zakir Naik, who has come all the way from Bombay and giving an excellent and thought-provoking speech and making us learn more about Islam and the religion. I also thank Muhammad Yasin Malpe and also Abdul Salam Puttige and uh, for uh, conducting these uh, meetings. Thanks for all the audience, for a patient hearing. Thank you. Asalaamu As Alaikum. to blame. The media is in their hands. If you know Al-Kindi, he was expert in physics, in mathematics, he first said that all laws aren't absolute, they are relative. All physical laws aren't absolute. Newton, Galileo, all of them said all physical laws are absolute. Al Kindi said no, they are relative. It was Albert Einstein who later on did more research and propounded the theory of relativity. We know about Muslims had. The amount of advances they made is tremendous. You know, there were Muslim scientists who were far advanced from the 8th to 12th century. If you know the scientific history, that Muslims were far advanced in several fields. In several, the first person who discovered the blood circulation was Ibn Nafis, 600 years after the revolution of the Quran. But today we know of William Harvey, 
William Harvey described blood circulation 400 years. Albert Einstein, no one knows about Al-Khindi. Shakir, Muhammad and Ahmad, these three brothers, they gave the surface area of the earth by measuring angle at the Red Sea. When people thought the world was flat. The person who first distilled alcohol, we learn in school, Gabar, Gabar. What is Gabar? He's Jabir, Jabir ibn Hayyan. They even Latinized the name. In trigonometry, Muslims are far advanced. If you know Al Buruni, he was expert in trigonometry and maths. We learn about the Pythagoras theorem in school that the square of the hypotenuse is equal to the sum of the square of the other two sides. Pythagoras theorem. Who, who discovered it? A Muslim, Al Abtusi, a Muslim. He discovered it. We know about Pythagoras theorem. We don't know about Al Abtusi. We are after Ibn Nafis. But no one knows about Ibn Nafis. Everyone knows about William Harvey. Media is in their hand. Then further, the first person who drew the world map was the Arab, Al Idrusi, in 1154. Mathematics, Muslim far advanced. The zero was learned from the Indians. The Arabs introduced zero and the decimal point to the world. 